So I want to end now with some challenges uh, to research in this area. Uh, and um, uh, I'll end on a positive note, but I, I do want to be open and honest about these challenges. Um, I've written about them as well as a number of other people have written about them. This is a paper that came out in 2015 in the American Psychologist where we review some of the conceptual and methodological challenges to research in this area. Um, and uh, this is a paper that just very recently came out a couple of weeks ago <coughs> in PLOS One that's receiving a lot of attention. Uh, and this is a paper that analyzed the data on uh, trials of um, mindfulness meditation for mental health um, um, changes and uh, reported a publication bias based on the looking at the effect size and the number of positive trials that have been reported. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this paper in PLOS One was picked up in Nature and uh, this was a news article in Nature um, and the subtitle here, Trials of Mindfulness to Improve Mental Health Selectively Report Positive Results. Um, this is a very important issue. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about using adequate comparison groups, the impossibility of conducting double-blind randomized controlled trials with meditation because someone who's assigned to a meditation group obviously knows what the intervention is that they're receiving. So they cannot be blind to it. Um, the issue of publication bias, issue of small effect sizes and poor experimental design, heterogeneity of participants, and also how we can better measure mindfulness. I'm not going to be able to cover all of these in detail, but I just want to give you a little bit of a feel for this. So in 2012, we published a paper um, reporting on uh, and presenting an active comparison control for mindfulness-based stress reduction. We put a lot of time and energy into developing this comparison treatment. We call it the Health Enhancement Program. And it's a, a comparison group that is matched in every possible way in terms of group involvement. Uh, it involves uh, light physical exercise, music-induced relaxation, um, nutritional information. It has the same amount of practice. Most importantly, we actually match the enthusiasm of the instructors in their confidence that this intervention will promote well-being. And the extent to which they believe that is comparable to the instructors who teach MBSR. That's really important. And what we reported in this paper is that on every self-report measure that or virtually every self-report measure that had been used to study MBSR, we find no difference between MBSR and the active comparison group. So um, uh, this is a sobering reminder that at least some of the variance in reported changes in response to MBSR may be associated with nonspecific effects of an intervention. We do see other differences, and in this particular paper, we had a um, uh, a pain protocol, and we see differences in certain aspects of pain responsivity. Um, this was an important paper that was published in 2014 in JAMA Internal Medicine uh, on a, a systematic review and meta-analysis of um, programs for, to relieve meditation-based programs to relieve stress and, and promote well-being. And there are two tables from this paper that really capture the, the data here. The first table is this, and you don't have to know what's in here. These are just different conditions like anxiety and depression. But if you look here, um, this is reporting the effect size, and if it's to the left, it favors meditation. And these are trials with nonspecific controls, like weightless controls. Now, I contrast this with a summary of those studies that have used active controls. You see here. Um, uh, and so the importance of using these active comparison groups is absolutely critical if we want to assign specificity to the essential ingredients that we think may be producing change. Uh, and so, again, a very important reminder of the importance of doing it this way. And finally, I just want to end with um, how we can better measure mindfulness. And we 
um, published a paper a couple of years ago uh, uh, that presents a very simple behavioral procedure that involves breath counting. And the essential elements of this is the following. If I ask you to tap a key, or for that matter, we do it on an iPad now, tap with every breath cycle. Just simply tap each time you have an inhalation. It turns out that when you measure objectively respiration in the laboratory, your ability to tap uh, in relation to your breathing is virtually perfect. Um, correlations exceed 0.98 in every sample we've, every normal sample we've looked at. People could do this very accurately. However, we then ask them to tap a second finger or another key every nth breath, say every ninth breath. And when you ask them to make that second tap every ninth breath, they make mistakes. And they make mistakes that coincide with reports of mind wandering. And so um, this is showing data uh, on errors in counting that are associated with um, experience sampling reports of being on task or off task. This is a measure of mind wandering. And what you can see is that higher error rates are associated with more mind wandering. Uh, in addition, we have um, looked at relations between uh, um, measures of meta-awareness, that is the awareness of making mistakes, for example, and of being aware uh, that you are aware. Uh, and um, uh, counting accuracy is associated with improved meta-awareness. Uh, and also, this is another measure of mind wandering here. And these are just two independent samples. We also see that there's good test-retest reliability. People who are good at um, counting accuracy one week are good in another week. We also compared experienced meditators to novices, and the experienced meditators do better on this task. Um, and so these data, there are more data that we have in this paper, too, uh, that establish the construct validity of this measure. And this is a simple measure that can be inserted <coughs> excuse me, into clinical trials, and they can um, substitute for, or at least complement, self-report measures of mindfulness, which we just published a paper questioning the construct validity of those self-report measures of mindfulness. If you have someone in a mindfulness intervention and then you ask them on a self-report measure about how mindful they are, the answers that you get are not going to be that scientifically meaningful. And so we think that this kind of behavioral measure may be a very useful addition at the very least. OK, so I'm going to skip this extension to children since we don't have time. And I want to just refer you to our center website, centerhealthyminds.org, uh, for more information. And I want to end with a quote from a book that was on the bestseller list for a while that really, I think, captures the, the possibilities and opportunities in this area. And this was actually written by the Dalai Lama in his book, The Art of Happiness. Um, but actually, before I do that, let me just say, these days I am just a simple mouthpiece for an amazingly talented group of scientists uh, in our lab uh, that I am grateful for every single day. Um, and uh, this is uh, what the Dalai Lama had to say about this. He said, the systematic training of the mind, the cultivation of happiness, the genuine inner transformation by deliberately selecting and focusing on positive mental states and challenging negative mental states is possible because of the very structure and function of the brain. But the wiring in our brains is not static, not irrevocably fixed. Our brains are also adaptable. Thank you very much.